I don't get to see myself. <laughs> how, how is this? <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, it, first of all, I just have to say, Mark, it's incredible to hear what's going on at the museum. Um, the legacy is true and clear and growing. Uh, wow, how, how vivacious it is. Um, and humbling to be here to witness all that is going on. Uh, this is a humbling task, and I thank the board once again for asking me to present the folks that we have known or are soon to meet for the first time who have left their mark, their legacy on the Gunflint Trail, um, along with those that go well into the record books at the museum. Um, like I said, it's a privilege to do this. I don't know how many of you like to read obituaries in the paper. I do. so. Um, I love getting to know people by reading their obituaries. It's a way to honor their lives. Um, so I see this as a privilege to not only research their obituaries, but I talk to Bonnie and, and Kath, and they find things up in the museum that I can pull from. I've talked to some family and some friends. It's just um, a privilege, and I wish you could all be in on those conversations because it's as if you know every single person um, that I get to introduce you to today and at the same time recognize their uniqueness and uh, their individual connection to the Gunflin Trail. So I will share this with you um, and I know there's some in the room that would be able to share a story or two when we're done uh, so that we can get an even more complete picture in meeting everybody that we have today. This quickly became an annual tradition for the Historical Society. Um, I think Lee is on Zoom, and Sue and Betty and uh, Bruce are here, but I remember the early, and Bill, the early meetings. Um, you would just kind of get up at one of the meetings and talk about who passed on this year, who we can remember. So it's gone from that compassion um, into this high-tech presentation. Um, <laughs> but it has always been a critical part of what the Historical Society has offered to this community and how we've grown into a much tighter knit community. This year I was drawn to John Hendrickson's books because this is a year we've said goodbye to John. And so this treasure of a book, um, I took a quote out of here to the Anishinaabe, the Ojibwe, the original people of this region, all creatures, including man, are related and dependent upon one another. There was much communication among them, as well as a deep sense of spiritual oneness. I think he just named this whole idea of how we're connected. And it begins with the native original peoples that were here. I say from the, the Chippewa bands to the early pioneers to the people we're going to meet today, we sit on their shoulders, we carry their legacy each and every day. A good friend of mine, Sarah Thompson, is a singer-songwriter from Duluth, um, and I hope you'll indulge with me a song that she has written um, that uses the elements of earth, wind, um, fire, what is the fourth? She's a frequent uh, visitor to the Boundary Waters, so if you'll just uh, indulge me with a, a song and just relax in your chairs and, and take in a moment. Should we try that again? 
And by the way, if you haven't ever seen Sarah perform, she relishes sing-alongs. So if it sounds catchy to you and you like the words, um, she would be honored if you sing along. Should we try it again? Try again. Try again. Yeah. You're warming up, you're tuning in. <laughs> <laughs> How do we want to do this? Tell me. Try that. Now try. We could I could simply read it too. One more time. One more okay, time. One more time. Here we go. Here we go. Like the sun and like the moon, 
wanted to add um, that I have traditionally brought this singing bowl and that has become part of the tradition so after each name I will ring the bowl as we uh, send our memories into the ether so with that let us meet our neighbors who have crossed the threshold to the great beyond David, David Gerkensmeyer, he passed away in 2021. We didn't catch that last year. So we wanted to remember David Gerkensmeyer um, passed away at the age of 77. Um, maybe some of you knew him. He, he has a familiar face to me, even his high school picture. He taught high school biology for 31 years. He sang in the Bethlehem Lutheran Church in Indianapolis, Indiana, and in Grand Marais. He shared his passion for the BWCA with his family and friends, and he lived out his dream on Seagull Lake with his wife, Jan, for over 15 years. Those who were blessed to know David learned to love and respect the deep woods. We remember David. Janice Gerkensmeyer passed away November 16th, 2021 at age 73. Married for 51 years, she passed away five days after her husband, David. Mm -hmm. She had a doctorate degree in psychiatric nursing from Indiana University. And after moving from Indiana to a wilderness home on the Gunflint Trail, Janice continued to conduct research and completed her final project before retirement of funded major National Institute of Health Study. She was a natural born caregiver, very passionate about her work and her family. These things I pulled from both of their obituaries, which were just tremendous to read. Mm -hmm. Remembering Janice Gerkensmeyer. Nancy Nunstead Bargain. Yeah, Nunstead, that name rings a bell. She lived to the age of 84, passing away in uh, May of 2022. Uh, the Nunstead family was a family that bought Chippewa in 1931 and ran it until 1952. Nancy was born in 1937, so my guess is she grew up at Chippewa. Um, I don't know when she might have left or come back. I don't know anything about the details of her life. But uh, Bonnie and uh, Kath were able to pull up this picture from archives, and she's the little one in her daddy's arms. Mm -hmm. That's Norbert Mayer, son of Lydia, on the left, Art and Lydia Nunstead, and then Nancy Nunstead um, being held by her father. I don't know the dog's name. <laughs> Remembering Nancy Nunstead Bargain. James Sandrock. He lived to the age of 93 and passed away on June 6th of 2022. Um, 
I didn't have a particular lake that he was associated with, um, but he was an avid traveler to the Gunpoint Trail. Um, he was a professor of German language and literature at the University of Iowa. He was an active birder, collaborated and edited publications. Along with his wife, they wrote the Iowa Nature Calendar and the scientific nomenclature of birds in the upper Midwest. Suzanne is on Zoom, I think, maybe she knows him. Um, Jim and his wife, Jean Pryor Sandrock, shared a deep love for the Minnesota North Woods, its plants, animals, and geology, as well as its people and culture. For years, they traveled here to bird, canoe, hike, and marvel in this glorious land. Jim's daughter, Joey, was their frequent companion. They rarely missed the fall warbler migration. His interests were so closely in line with the mission of Chickwalk, they chose the Historical Society as one place for his memorials, as have many people here. But uh, this was made known to me to a friend or family member that gave me the information. Remembering Jim Sandrock. Kay Chambers Bach from Gunflint Lake because she was a dear friend of Betty Hempstead's. Kay lived to be 88 years old and passed away in June of 2022. And Betty, I'm so glad you're here because we didn't get a connect so that I could get more information. So I'm hoping you have some stories to share. I got this from her um, obituary that you two chaired the Adina Centennial celebration in 1988. So hang on and tell us more, will you please? Remembering K. Chambers Bach. Okay, I knew this would be a hard one. <laughs> Excuse me. Judy Edmund, and I selfishly took this picture. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it was one that I think Bonnie you took the picture it was probably at um, a pie social mm. but I just yeah had to put that one in other than her beautiful picture that you put in with her obituary um, our beloved Judy passed away at the age of 80 on July 11th of 2022 and Ashley you can help me remember I know it was a year ago and we knew that she was close to taking her last breath and I said Please, Judy, hang on. Don't pass before I do this <laughs> at the July meeting of 2022. And I believe she passed the day of mm -hmm. our meeting one year ago. Wow. So thanks, Judy, for holding on so we could um, share with you this day and this time. She was a dedicated mother first and foremost. Judy treasured her children and embraced every moment with them. She especially loved her role as granny an important part of Judy's life in the past 15 years was her service and participation on the board of directors for the Gunflint Trail Historical Society. She was the event coordinator among many things. She was a volunteer at the Chickwalk Museum and the Nature Center, and she was a part of the Mid Trail Property Owners Association. But we remember her best for her hospitality and hosting all of the fundraising events for so many years. I got to talk to Jim. Jim and Judy have been on the Gunflin Trail for 47 years, and Jim gave me these quotes. She and her son Kyle were blessed with the gift of hospitality. You can remember that we remembered Kyle a couple of years ago. We happened to walk into Trail Center with four people gathering and we became the president and vice president of the first mid-trail property owners. <laughs> <laughs> she was also gifted with raising flower gardens. I see flowers here today. Judy was the consummate entertainer. I think everybody in this room could probably raise their hand and tell a story about Judy Edmund. Remembering Judy Edmund. Philip or Phil Sackery from Sag Lake. 
He lived to the age of 73, passing away last July 26th. He worked for the Burlington Northern San Francisco Railroad. Is that what that stands for? For 35 years? Santa Fe. Santa Fe. Santa Fe. Santa Fe. Okay. <laughs> BNSF. For 35 years, he enjoyed fishing and spending time at his cabin in the Northwoods. Phil especially treasured the time spent with his family. Again, I found this from his obituary. If somebody knows Phil, you can share his story when we finish. Remembering Phil Sacri. The Reverend Dr. J.A.O. Jacob Al Addison, forgive me for saying your name wrong, Jack Bruce the Third, from Gunflint Lake. He lived to be the young age of 69, passing away last August, August 4th. Uh, and maybe the name rings a bell immediately. Jack's grandfather, Jacob A. O. Pruce, uh, was Minnesota's governor from 1921 to 1925. He's in our history books. He actively supported the construction and improvement of the Gunflint Trail. And as governor, he ultimately purchased property on the Canadian side of Gunflint Lake. We can say, and the rest is history. As we know, the, the Proust family. Um, this information was given to me by his son. Hmm. Favorite childhood memories, spending the long summer days as a youth in the 1960s, working hard, building and fixing cabins, fishing, and exploring with his older sisters and cousins. Later, he introduced his wife Sherry and their children to Gunflint. Jack and his family would take the long drive from Missouri to spend many summers at the lake where Jack would show Jack the Fourth, Emily and Rebecca, the beauty and wonders of the Boundary Waters. In their retirement, Jack and Sherry spent their summers at Gunflint, enjoying a retreat from their home in Arizona. The Proust family continues to enjoy spending time on the Gunflint today. Jack the Fourth and Emily make regular trips to the lake, and Rebecca McAllister and her family have made their home on Gunflint Lake. As an et LCMS Lutheran pastor and a professor of systematic theology at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri. He was also a chaplain in the U.S. Navy Reserves and was assigned to the 3rd Battalion, 24th Regiment of the U.S. Marine Corps during the first Gulf War. And in 1998, he became the third president of Concordia University in Irvine, California. After retiring from Concordia Irvine in 2009, he was executive vice president of Bethesda Lutheran Communities until his retirement in 2014. A lot accomplished in a brief life. Remembering the Reverend Dr. Jack Proust III. Jerry Carpenter on Siegel Lake, known by many, friend to everyone, he lived to be 89 years of age, passing away last October 13th. Jerry was a, a bush pilot in Alaska, and they built their cabin on Seagull sometime before 1973. He spent winters at the cabin on Seagull because he was a pilot in Alaska in the summertime. <laughs> but Lorraine stayed back in Alaska for the winters because she was a nurse. Lorraine passed away in 2012. And after retiring from flying, Jerry drove a towboat for Tuscarora Outfitters for a few summers. He took many fall canoe trips into the Quetico and the BWCA. A good guy, a great friend, um, I'm sure many of you know and have stories of Jerry Carpenter. <coughs> we remember Jerry Carpenter. Jimmy Clark, or James Jimmy Jeffrey Clark, from Lake Onagon. I did not know his age. He passed away on October 15th, so if anybody knew Jimmy. His deep affection for nature saw him share his passion with his family and friends embarking on countless adventures. Favorite retreats were to Alaska to fish, hike, and visit family, and to his cabin on the Gunflint Trail canoeing and fishing the boundary waters. No kids of his own. He loved his nieces and nephews with all his being. 
He loved to share stories and make others laugh with his uncanny sense of humor. Jim loved the Lord Jesus and put his trust in him. Remembering Jimmy Clark. Alfred Michael, Dr. Michael from Seagull Lake. This is from his obituary as well. He lived to the age of 94, passing away last September 25th. He was devoted to medical education, research, and clinical care. He obtained his medical degree in 1953, and his career at the University of Minnesota began in 1967. Excuse me a minute. He has a really great obituary, by the way. Mm -hmm. In 1996, he became Dean of the University of Minnesota Medical School, a position he held until 2002. He retired in 2006 at the age of 78 years. He was a passionate fisherman, displayed the same talent he gave to his career with his fishing pole, catching many prized walleye out of his beloved Seagull Lake at the end of the Gunfoot Trail where he sojourned yearly for over 50 years. As devoted as he was to the medical care and well-being of all children, Alfred was, Alfred was even more devoted to his family. He nurtured those closest to him with his gifts of love and time, and these gifts will sustain them for years to come. Remembering Dr. Alfred Michael. Barry Bonoff from Seagull Lake. A lot of you nodding your heads, knowing but Barry. Barry passed away at the age of 91, last December 25th. He was proud of his service in the Army Counterintelligence Corps during the height of the Cold War. Probably best known, he took over Jackson Graves, a woman's specialty clothing store that was founded by his father. Jackson Gray's in Minneapolis, I should say. He was a successful retailer. Barry was larger than life, excuse me, and cared deeply for his community. He was a passionate advocate for nature, from the board of the Minnesota Zoo to the BWCA community member on the Gunflint Trail. His niece Jane gave me this story. <laughs> he repurposed the glass elevator for the Jackson Graves store in Minneapolis to his outhouse <laughs> on Seagull Lake. It was a beautiful view. <laughs> Above all, Barry's greatest accomplishment and love was his family. Uncle Barry to Jane Johnson on Tucker Lake. Remembering Barry Bonoff. I think the fans are sending dust my way. <clears throat> John Henriksen, John Frederick Henriksen, Gunflint Lake. John passed away at the age of 95 on December 23rd of last year. John became a very well-regarded author of books about North Minnesota's North Woods. He served in the Marines during World War II. He was married to Julie for 67 years. Julie passed away in 2020. He was at, they were at their happiest, spending May through October every year at the cabin they bought in 1980 on the shore of Gunflint Lake. He produced books on Rachel Carson, the Gunflint Trail, <clears throat> the Voyagers who explored what is now the Boundary Water Canoe Area, and two anthologies of North Country writers. Most notable were his memoir called The Gunflint Cabin and an account of the creatures that he encountered there, A Wild Neighborhood, which won the Minnesota Book Award for Nature Writing in 1998. I also have his other book called The Gunflint. <clears throat> John and Julie became a vital part of the local community of the Gunflint Trail as they hiked with their dogs, canoed, cross-country skied, volunteered for various trail-related causes, and generally reveled in their unspoiled 
surroundings. Julie knit mittens for the the uh, gift shop, um, and we just need to mention the canoe races. They were both so active as a part of our annual canoe races. They passed along their love of the area, not just to their daughters, but to their grandchildren as well. To see John sitting on the dock with his ever-present mug of coffee and gazing towards the Canadian shoreline was to see a study in contentment. Remembering John Henriksen. Curry Thompson. Curry lived everywhere in the gun country. <coughs> he called the woods his home. He lived to the age of 50, dying in a tragic fire on December 29th of this last year. Curry had a love for the outdoors in the Gunpland Trail. He would go away and come back. He could not ever leave the Gunpland Trail. He worked for various resorts. Lastly, he was a companion and caregiver for Ted Young, and he helped groom the Banadan Trail. Probably a familiar face to a lot of us on the Gunpland Trail. Remembering Curry Thompson. Phyllis Knudsen. What lake was Phyllis on? Anybody know? I don't have her lake. She lived to be 79 years of age, uh, passed away last January, January 16th. This is from her obituary. A deeply satisfied homebody, often telling family, I'm just content in my four little walls. She and longtime companion Bob enjoyed going to the movies, having dinner with friends at the American Legion, and the evening ritual of a cocktail, hers, a brandy Manhattan. She never missed her daily 30 minutes with Pat Sajak and Vanna White. <laughs> you want to read her obituary too, this is great. She was, she was an animal and a nature lover, but dogs stole her heart. She loved peanut brittle, Smarties candies, spending time at the family cabin on the Gunflin Trail, and Hallmark Channel Christmas movies. It was talking to friends about and showing photos of her grandson Tyler that lit her up like a Christmas tree. She knew exactly who she was and never pretended to be anything else. That authenticity drew others to her. People in her orbit knew inner peace when they saw it. Remembering Phyllis Knudsen. <coughs> Tom Hendrickson, Hungry Jack Lake, my neighbor. He lived to be 88 years of age, passing away just this past April 4th. If you know about Swanson's Lodge, the historic lodge, that's where he lived. And he stayed there at Swanson Resort as a fisherman in 1971. He bought half the property in 1972 and the whole property in 1989. He became a surrogate son to Walter Bunn. And Walter got to live on that property until 1991, the year of his passing. Tom and Linda operated the lodge as a retreat center for 10 years with people helping to rehab the historic Swanson's Lodge. And Linda said that is Tom's legacy, that they were able to restore that lodge. And we enjoy it to this day because of the work they did. She told me that Walter was thrilled to see the lodge and its buildings being completely restored. Tom is also known for his English springers. He had an English springer on the property for 43 years. Tom and Linda retired from the family-owned business in 1999 and moved to Florida living on Hungry Jack during the summer. The restoration work on the property continues with children and grandchildren. Remembering Tom Hendrickson. And at last, we have Tom Battenhausen, who just passed away a little over a month ago at the age of 75. Tom was on West Pope Lake 
He was a career firefighter in Chicago for 30 years. He was on our fire department for um, a little while. Um, and, but he has a long history on the trail. I got this information from his granddaughter. Stayed at Borderland Lodge for years before buying property up here. And his brothers um, were up here with him as well. They bought the property on West Pope around 1990. <coughs> Get this. He put an ad in the Grand Marais paper asking for property for sale. <laughs> and somebody said, yeah, I've got a little, I know of a little piece on West Polk that they might be interested in selling to you. And that's how he got, can you imagine that today? <laughs> it was a one room cabin with an outhouse, no electricity. And his granddaughter Sarah was just laughing as she recalled how everyone would pile into that little cabin and their grandpa was snoring away. <laughs> And they, she even said, we've got more to find out about this, but she said they, the cabin had papers in the walls signed by the names of the people who originally built the cabin. So there's some history there. Uh, they gradually rebuilt, not that cabin, a whole new cabin. They had to take the original cabin down. Um, and Tom and his wife always wanted to retire full time to the cabin. I talked to Larry Wooding, his neighbor, and he said, oh, they had a lot of fun dressing the smoking the bear sign at the entrance to his property. Uh, he gave me some of the outfits they used to put on Smokey the Bear. And I learned not only from Larry, but Sarah as well that, and we know this from the fire department, or if you knew Tom at all, he was a prankster. He was just always pulling pranks. Memories of fun times at the cabin are his legacy to his family. Remembering Tom Bettenhausen. The trail, the people, the stories. We each have our own connection to the trail, yet we share so much in common with one another. I'd like to read just a little bit that I found in John's book, The Gunflint, and he's, it's his chapter called Gunflint Characters, Builders of the Name. And he's talking about the relationship between personalities and landscape. And he says, over the century, there have been many of these whose often vinegary personalities would define this land, strong, unconventional, independent men and women who never really fit into any of the niches other segments of their society offered. The bird lady of the trail, Molly Hoffman, sums it up. Even today, she says, there is less homogeneity on the trail, so to be different is to fit. <laughs> And with that, as you look over the names of the folks that we've remembered today or have gotten to meet for the first time, I'd like to just ring the bell for all the folks that are coming up in your memory now that have passed on that you remember. Uh, let's just ring this nicely three times. Turn on the lights. I'd like to open it up. We have some. We have the rest of the afternoon to have some, to some storytelling. And if you're going to tell a story, please this, come up and yeah. stand behind. Bar beside Barb, and then we'll capture it. Yeah. Do you have anything more you want to add about Kay? <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope you plan to stay for another half hour. <laughs> um, Kay and I were, she was my best friend in Edina, and we became best friends being volunteers. 
Uh, we did many events together. We started an event called E Dynamite. Uh, it was a um, fundraiser for all projects in our city. And because of that, we got involved in the very beginnings of the Dyna Foundation, <laughs> um, serving as president and vice president and secretary, et cetera. And now it's really a going affair, which is wonderful to look at. Um, um, Did she help you take any pictures of flowers? <laughs> <laughs> no, but she loved coming up here. And she's a supporter of Chippewa which I'm very grateful, and also her family feels the same way. Um, I want to tell you one little thing that's sort of cute. I think it's cute, funny. Um, I don't think I really look like her, but don't put her picture back up. It was when she was real young. <laughs> um, the mayor called, well, a number of people in Edina called us the twins because we were into everything. And uh, I wonder why. But anyway, um, when the mayor went on vacation, I got this postcard, and it was written with just half sentences, and I, why did he send this, to, you know, what, he, was he absent-minded, had he been drinking? <laughs> uh, and um, she called me that day, and she said, I got this card from Jim, I can't understand it. Well, we found out, because he thought we were twins, he took two postcards, put them together, wrote across them, <laughs> so I got half and she got half. <laughs> so, sort of a fun little anecdote. But anyway, thank you for listening. And Kay was my best friend there, and really one of my best friends on the Gunfman Trail was John Hendrickson. Mm -hmm. And I must just say something about him. Why don't I just tell you how we met? I think you know that I have a wildflower book, so I was searching for wildflowers, and I would go anywhere. So I was down on my tummy in a ditch, and it was quite a deep ditch, and he came driving along the Gunflint Trail and <laughs> saw someone down there, so he got, gets out of his car and says, are you okay? <laughs> of course I was, and that's how we met. And, uh, <laughs> and if you ever read the acknowledgments in the back of my book, it says John Hendrickson was the stone in my hiking boot because if it wasn't for John, I don't think I ever would have completed the book because he kept after me. So thank you. Nice. Thank you. Anyone else want to share a story or two? Online? <laughs> if Suzanne, did she know Jim? Well, I could say something more about Judy. I bet you could. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, please. You know, Judy was also a pilot, and we came to Grand Marais because of flying. And uh, Judy loved her flowers. She really, she became got an award as a master gardener in Columbia Heights on several occasions. Even got money for it. And uh, so. <clears throat> Her flowers were so important to her that uh, a couple of times I would leave the cabin, go to the airport, fly home, water the flowers, cut mm -hmm. the grass, and fly back. Now I say, boy, that was something. But anyhow, uh, that was her passion, was the flowers. And Matthew knows it, and Matthew, since he was a ch little baby, he came up here. So um, we, Judy loved this thing, and she was, a, I think she was really gifted, and I say gifted, with the, uh, with the gift of hospitality. She knew how to entertain, which explains why we have all that silver <laughs> serving pieces. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, she loved to entertain. She loved to be involved uh, in Arizona. Uh, we all started out in the cities in, in, uh, with the Junior League. And uh, whenever there's a project, I and our two sons always got to move things and do things. But she was always involved in, in fundraising, and she did that in, in Arizona. She was a member of PEO, if any of you know of that when my wife was in PEO. So it went on there, and then here, and she just loved Chickwalk, and she was involved in it right from the beginning, wasn't she, Bruce? Yeah. One of and, my best partners on the board. Yeah, and uh, she, uh, she loved it so much, her memorial uh, that was for Chickwalk. And, and I think it was somewhat generous, I would assume. Um, but um, 
this was our home, and we and uh, this is where we were anchored. Uh, we had a home in in Roseville. Uh, we sold our big house, and uh, we bought a little condo at Midland Hills Country Club because Judy said, "Well, you're not retired yet. We need a place to stay." So we were the last year we owned it. We used it three nights. And I thought that was kind of uh, so we sold that a long time ago. So this really was our home. Uh, we vote here. Uh, we pay taxes here. We're, it, we're, we try to be part of the community. In my, in my being in business, I had to be part of the community. That's what I did. <clears throat> so uh, uh, the thing that I miss the most, uh, people have said, well, <clears throat> first of all, I miss the flowers. So if you come to the house, there are some flowers in the Sioux that are planted. <laughs> my my son-in-law came up and planted some. I said, that's enough. <laughs> I won't be able to take care of any more than that. And uh, so that's, uh, that's the thing I miss so much is the color she added to everybody's life in my experience. So mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for that. And I have that picture that you have, it, it's on my phone. Is that where you got it? No, it's oh, on my it, phone. Is it? Yeah. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> yeah. 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 So um, thank you for uh, remembering Judy. Uh, this was her passion up here. Mm -hmm. so. to say Judy raised the bar. <laughs> Where's Fred? Fred? No, Fred. Hey, hi Sue. Yes, absolutely. Good to see you. I have to talk about Judy and tell you that the Pi Social would not be in existence without Judy. Thank you. And not only that, if it had been me, we would have had a banquet table slapped down there with <laughs> all those pies. But Judy brought the tablecloths. She made sure that we had the silver. Also, don't forget to bring the cream and the sugar and the everything. And this is your assignment. And Bruce, you're gonna help Jim park cars and shuttle people over. And by the way, here's sandwiches in, place, in case you get hungry. I mean, she had us organized and it's carried on today, but I, I think she really put us on the right track. This is not some slapdash thing. We are have a little taste of elegance, as much as you get in the Northwoods, of course. <laughs> and I also want to say a couple things about John Hendrickson. Bruce and I, if you follow the online auctions, are going to give somebody, whom I don't know who, a tour of Gunflint Lake and stories for an obscene amount of money. And I've been reading John's book, this one. And as many of you know, I've read a lot about the history of the Gunflint Trail. Many of the people mentioned in John's book I know personally or knew personally. Bruce is on the disc afterward, which I can't read because the disc in my copy is in pieces, literally. <laughs> I don't know why, but it is. Anyway. I know you can find another one. Yeah, I'm sure I can, but I can't find a disc player nowadays. <laughs> anyway, I read these stories and I found, I had read the book before, but you know, I was in business and I kind of probably skimmed it and that was it. But there are brand new stories in there that I have never heard before. Um, one of the ones that I think about Janet Hansen is in there, and as many of you know, she was Bruce's mother's partner for 25 years in the canoe outfitting, but gets, she never gets the, the credit that she deserves because she had no family and she left here. She ran up an outfitters on Seagull Lake for a while, but we kind of forget her and it's too bad. Another one in here is, um, Mama Gallagher. As you know, in Magnetic Lake, there's Gallagher's Island. It's always called that. We kind of know the story about Ben Gallagher, but we forget about Mama Gallagher. And she was a determined woman in her own right. I believe she was, she, was she five foot two, do you think? Maybe, Maybe yeah, was, yeah. Maybe. And she met Ben, she was a war widow from World War I. And she was a champion uh, skeet shooter in, in France, 
oh well, she was an international champion. And she would take, one time I went over to meet her. Bruce and I were going to get married, so we were invited to dinner over there. And I had just gone out and Bruce had showed me how to fire a rifle, which I had never done in my life. I knew nothing about him. I still know very little. And so what else am I going to talk with this woman? I mean, I have nothing in common. And she took and said, um, well, if the rifle is too heavy for you, Bruce should take you to his gunsmith and have a proper gun made for you. <laughs> and on the way back in the boat, I said, Bruce, do you even know a gunsmith? <laughs> <laughs> but these are the kind of stories that she, or John Hendrickson, dug out about people. And they're just fascinating. She talks about, with Mrs. Gallagher in particular, she was berating Bruce's mother for the attire she wore. And as the owner and the hostess of a resort, she should wear something better. And Mama Gallagher was a uh, trained or educated in a nunnery. And she was a seamstress. And she made Bruce's mother, and the story's right in here, you can read it. She made Bruce's mother a blue silk dress with hand embroidery and stitching on it. <laughs> yes, and gave it to her for Christmas. And John apparently asked mother what happened with the dress, and she says, I don't know, I never wore the damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> but these are the kind of stories that John tells in here. And they're about people we've all heard of. But John has dug out that extra dimension of a story. And if you like the Gunflin Trail, and to a certain extent it's around Gunflin and that, he dug them out. And he was a, uh, was he, a journalist for a long time. And so it's a very interesting book. And again, he's somebody who kind of fades away from us because he wasn't real active. His wife, Julie, was real active with the canoe races for years. She did the publicity for it. And she was a very small, diminutive woman. And her passion was hiking trails. But. Um, I really recommend his book to you for someone if you're interested in the history and I think John did a great service to all of us by talking with these people because how many of us have sat here referring to a parent or another relative and say why didn't I ask whatever after they were gone but John asked those questions so that's all I have to say. We'll have to somehow harvest that from this CD. Um, the, the people yeah, she's got a lot of interesting people. Well, the first one is Well, so not so much. It, Bruce Kerfoot. <laughs> 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 Janet Hansen. For copy, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Dick Anderson. Um, <coughs> Charlene, Charlene Latourneau. <coughs> Ted Young. Who else is in there? Um, <coughs> but Dave Tuttle, we don't love <coughs> him either. Galen Liebers. <laughs> Boy, that's a young Dave Tuttle there. Well, you know, time ages us all. What happened to your hair? I, it got short. Yeah, it got short. This book was so, written in 2003. It is a gem. Yeah, really it really gem. is. This stuff. Yeah. Some of the things that, the quotes that she's dug out from, or he's dug out from various sources are just amazing. I should read his, there's one in here. And I shouldn't read it because it's about somebody who has the same last name as I have, but you're going to be stuck with it. <laughs> i got to find it. She knows it. She knows it's the page. Yeah, it's, it's about Bruce's up. There we go. He, Alice Brand. There's another wonderful Dina woman. Madsen. Yeah, Dina Madsen was just wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Chris Powell, another wonderful person. Bruce's mother, Justine. And she tried to describe her, or he tried to describe Justine, and he found a quote from Kevin Proshel. Proshel? How do you pronounce his name? Bruce? You know that 
He was for a long time associated the executive director of the Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness, which was um, not on the friendliest terms with Bruce's mother. <laughs> but this is what John said, Kevin wrote. But the most intriguing character of all was a five foot engine of raw energy, willpower, and chutzpah named Justine Kerfoot, who defied easy categorization. She had lived along the Gunflin Trail since the 1920s. She had visited as many countries as BWCAW lakes. She could easily charm an audience with her eloquence as she could embarrass a sailor with her vernacular. <laughs> <laughs> she had faced down bears, county commissioners, and anyone else who got in her way. Even environmentalists begrudgingly admired, admitted their fascination with her. But that's the stuff that John has filled this book with. Um, his one chapter talking about the Gunplun Trail calls it God's Backyard. <laughs> and I think we all feel that way about it. Yeah. So I recommend it for what it's worth. And I commend John for doing all of the work to dig out these stories and quotes. Thanks. Well, I Anyone else? It's funny, Sue, that you brought up God's Backyard because I was, I was reading this. Um, that's the one that stuck with me. The, the, first, the first chapter, yeah. the table of contents, the gun flint, God's Backyard. I know. And you know, as I sit here, try to capture what it is that we're all drawn to up here. How do you name that in a word or two? Um, but we all know that we just need to go out into God's backyard and the memories of all of the people that we're, we've named today, that Benny Ambrose to Tempest Powell to the, the history of the Gunflin Trail. You walk out in the woods and you smell those smells and you see those trees. Um, it, it all just keeps it alive. I think the woods and the waters, they're able to hold the memories of all those who have walked on this little piece of the earth that we call the Gunflint Trail. And it's a place that, as you know, when you were kids and you had the backyard, you could lose yourself in there, hide from mom and dad, get away from your older sister, whatever the heck it was. And you just, the, the bushes and the trees hid you. And the same is true of the Gunflint Trail. You can find that special place, and I'm sure every single person in here has that place. And you go there, and you can get away from those people who are bothering you. <laughs> hey, yeah, Betty. Um, would you hold up the Wild Neighborhood yep, a minute? I will. Uh, John told me that he wanted that book to be called God's Backyard. God's Backyard. Okay. But yeah. the powers that be in publishing. Well, and one. this book, you know, all those little encounters you had with the birds or the bears or the fox you saw or the moose that you just saw, uh, yeah, he writes about each of those. You know, and I wish I would have journaled what I saw when I or, or felt when I encountered that, but he's got that in here. This is another gem of a book. Yeah. Do we have both of these at the bookstore? The Wild Neighborhood is out of print. Ooh. I got to one with you. Okay. Yeah. I would just mention about the Gunflint book on a practical note, for those of us that travel long distances in cars, the beauty of that is it has a CD and uh, it's kind of like a oral history and it's really interesting to listen to. Uh, you can listen to it while you're driving down the freeway. Yeah. Yeah. Could, could we thank Barb? And those that work with fire for this incredible trip. That's your job. Thank you. And I might say you are going to post this on the website. If yes. There's, yep. there's something we've missed that needs to be there. Can, is there still time to like let me know and we can? We can do lots of magic. <laughs> we can tech magic. So. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Yes. Yes. Carry on. As usual. Tell the stories. I think that's one other thing that was uh, mentioned in here. In one of his books, he just says, you know, the Gunflin Trail is about the people that have brought their lives, their stories, 
that's what makes the Gunpoint Trail. It's the people. It's, that legacy continues.